Hello, folks. Brandon Chapman with you today. It's another video video from Theo Trade uh, for May 15th, uh, 2024. 2023, what am I doing? Uh, the debt ceiling dis disco is heating up. Is it time to get off the floor? That's the question today. We're going to talk about uh, um, the X date looming over the debt ceiling. Uh, of course, uh, as usual, the rhetoric is, is getting pretty thick out there as we as the fall is looming. Uh, so we're going to talk a little about the history of uh, um, of the debt ceiling a little bit, its impact on money market funds. And the question is, are, are we starting to see a little bit of a setup for a short squeeze higher? We're going to get a few different stocks here that have relatively high short interest and uh, a little bit of rotation to China or Chinese stocks in the midst of this as well. All right, let's get rolling. Now. So the S&P today was up about a third of a percent. Nothing super exciting. When you look at it on a sector by sector basis, what you'll see is today um, that uh, the materials stocks lead. Uh, a couple of stocks we're going to peek a peek at today, ERO and IE are co copper stocks. Technology, of course, in the mix. Uh, of course, you got Microsoft, Apple having an outsized impact there. Uh, financial is getting a little bit boost today. In fact, you look at KRE, uh, Michael Burry, maybe along some uh, um, uh, regional banks. He's the big short guy. But the problem is, is that, look, I mean, there's optimism here, right? We're trying to say, hey, you know, utilities down 1.26%. You know, if you look at treasuries, yields are moving higher. And so we have this kind of confusing kind of environment where everyone's trying to figure stuff out. And so, again, we've got kind of materials, financials, and, and uh, technology. On one end, we have utilities and staples on the other end. Um, does this really is this really leading us to expect we're going to see a bullish breakout here? Sometimes, in order to get the to get the final nail in the coffin, you've got to see that you got to see the shorts get squeezed. And uh, so, again, do we see a breakout here in the ES, or is it just maybe just by by proxy? Like some areas of the market may break out, meanwhile the market generally stays flat. As we look at the VIX indicators, for example, the VIX today down slightly or basically up uh, slightly. Uh, the VIX 3M to VIX ratio, as we're trying to identify the outlook for future volatility, um, ticking down from being above 1.2 on Friday. So the volatility markets are telling us, look, expect higher volatility in the near future. Uh, we look at SKU. This is still as of last Friday, but ticked up to 140. I would expect SKU will probably rise today. There is concern building right now. Now, it, could this be easily dispelled? Right, this these expectations for volatility or tail risk could this easily be dispelled if a debt ceiling uh, debt debt ceiling is negotiated? Yeah, we might see a bit of relief. We might see skew come in, um, but the reality is is that there is bigger stuff happening right now economically, and there's a pretty high probability we're going to have a recession this year. So the debt ceiling the debt ceiling may just be a little bit of a distraction, uh, very similar to 2011. We were angling towards recession. In fact, 2012, it looked like we were entering a recession. And all of a sudden, you saw very significant coordinated activity across multiple central banks globally to print money. And uh, that kind of lifted us out. You have Japan especially uh, going like kamikaze on monetary policy, buying REITs, stock, you know, ETFs, et cetera, buying all this stuff, and the yen getting devalued substantially. So... What we got to look at in, in, in part with this is that, look, we're being distracted, you know, about a debt ceiling and a default that's probably not going to happen. But looking through that, we probably have an, a, a, what's likely going to be a very aggressive uh, policy globally on the part of central banks when the recession starts to see and starts to even get further traction. So let's talk about the debts in a little bit. Let's look at IRX. This is three month T bills. This is going to be a good, pretty good approximation for what the Fed funds rate is. And more importantly, this is 13-week T-bills. These are going to mature in 13 weeks. And so as we start to look at and consider the debt ceiling neg the negotiations that are happening right now, this 13 weeks should carry us through this problematic period, that X date. Is it June 1st? Is it September 1st? Is it August? Whatever that date is, we should see prices being impacted here if it's aligning with that X date. And so far, we're seeing that we're trading below the midpoint of the Fed funds, the Fed funds target range of five, five and a quarter. So certainly there's not any real significant near term impact. Um, there are some articles that were written about this and and some suggesting that uh, um, there are there is a premium 
for stuff that's expiring soon of roughly 1%, meaning that uh, the average money market fund pays about a 5% yield. You know, maybe on some of these treasuries, they might be demanding a 6% yield. Well, in terms of bonds, prices up, um, yields down, right? Or vice versa, yields up, prices down. So there is maybe going to be some impact here. And the reality for money market funds, particularly those that are invested exclusively in U.S. treasuries, of which about 25% of money market funds of the 880, there's about 220, according to Crane, that are uh, that are just exclusively in U.S. treasuries, this is where you may see the biggest impact. So the point being is that we, we bandy about this term default. Well, what does this necessarily mean? Have we ever defaulted before? Yes, we have. We've engaged in previously and accidentally, in fact, a technical default. And so I'll use the word technical default. Why? Because it doesn't mean we didn't pay pay the actual interest or pay you know or, or pay off the bo the bonds are maturing. What happened was there was a glitch and and stuff you know money was not sent out and we engaged in a technical default. So if for some reason there's not a nego there's a negotiation and we don't come to a resolution, um, the treasury may elect to engage in a technical default. And, and this might be a means of trying to gain the upper hand against uh, members of the House and those 43 senators that say they're not going to, you know, they're not going to pass anything unless they, we, we some sort of agreement to spending cuts, which the Senate undercut the incoming Republicans last year by agreeing to a budget. Right. And so we're trying to gain hand at the moment. The Biden administration is trying to gain hand. Of course, we have uh, the, uh, the Republicans, in the House and the Senate try to gain back some hand. They were just elected. And the fact is the Biden administration is not in a great position right now, given maybe the intransigency of those of the Republicans, right? And so, and equally, the Biden administration might be intransigent, intransigent. But the point being is this, a technical default would be a choice of the Treasury to engage in. And a technical default is just what? It means they're not going to pay right now. <laughs> so, you know, so the idea is that, you know, we have not had sur for an annual surplus since 2001, so for 22 years, we've, on a year-by-year -year basis, we've just continued to expand our debt through deficit spending. And the fact of the matter is the Republican bill from the House does not exactly provide a pathway to surpluses. In fact, it doesn't even pr provide a pathway to solvency, right? So both sides are not do not really stand on the moral high ground here since neither are concerned so much about the potential default, actual default later on, when we can't pay our bills because of, you know, entitlement programs, et cetera, in, in interest on the debt. And so right now, the, the, the Treasury is faced with a choice to engage in a technical default, meaning we choose not to, to make our mortgage payment or our bond payments. And it doesn't mean they're not going to pay them at, at all. It just means it may be delayed. Well, what, what impact is that going to have on money market funds? Well, right now we have a situation where we've had a, a, a significant amount of lead time. So if you're a money market fund, you're probably potentially in instruments other than short-term treasuries. Um, the Fed right now has a, has a $2 trillion reverse repo operation going on right now. Does that start to pick up? I mean, there's plenty of opportunity to allay some of those fears with the exception of those money market funds that are in U.S. Treasury debt exclusively, which a quarter of them are. So look, if you're invested in that stuff, there may be some issues, right? If you want your money... Uh, immediately. So the question is, does a technical default spur a run on the bank, or in this case, on money market funds? Maybe some larger money management firms like a Vanguard, for example, a Fidelity, something like that. Could they use some of their cash to backstop some of their funds to provide for those immediate liquidity needs? Because again, the government's not going to default specifically on the debt. They might engage in a technical default, which may delay like 1979, making those payments. Now, we've certainly defaulted on agreements in the past of a financial nature. Uh, Bretton Woods comes to mind where they guarantee gold convertibility in, of U.S. dollars, right? Dollars for gold. That was suspended in 1971 and ended in 1973. That was an agreement we had. And, and again, did it affect the U.S. dollar as a reserve currency? Uh, not exactly. Um, we did shift predominantly from a savings-based economy to a debt-based economy, which is getting us back to the same kind of issues we have right now in terms of potential default. But again, there are, there may be in the near term 
some opportunity for for investors to step in. You know, if we do engage in a technical default, does it not go to six? Does it go to ten? What yield are people going to demand? Which could be a significant haircut if the stated yields five percent and they got to sell it at a steep discount, so it's generating a current yield of ten percent. You know, again, there may be opportunities for those stepping in to provide the liquidity to buy these uh, to buy these bonds, factoring in or, or technically just saying, look, it's just a technical default. They're going to pay it. So we don't know exactly what's going to happen, but there are negotiations. And it's, again, is it of a consequential nature? I guess not, because either scenario does not change the trajectory of our economy, of our government, and its deficit spending and debt. So yeah, the Republicans say, let's just turn back the clock to 2022. Let's limit the pace of growth of spending to 1%. Yeah, it may sound like a decent deal, you know, but the reality is, you know, there's, there's, again, Elections have consequences, as I said so often. And right now we have both sides trying to show to their base as we are, are entering uh, into an election year shortly, you know, that they're they're accomplishing something, right? So again, we'll see how far it gets. But just, you know, it gives kind of a headline here on, uh, on the effect on money market funds right now. And, and again, you may want to prepare. And the realities right now is that, yes, 5% sounds really attractive, but let's be honest. Is the Fed going to keep rates at 5%? The answer is likely no, okay? They want to cut to ZERP. Um, the federal government wants them to cut rates, um, and they want the debt ceiling increase so they can continue to, to expand our debt to GDP greatly. You know, and, and we think about this whole deficit thing. It's a bipartisan effort, right? Uh, Bush inter introduced $1 trillion deficits. Trump introduced $3 trillion deficits, and we're probably going to have a $3 trillion or somewhere close to that this year. And again, I hope, you know, again, hopefully we don't, you know, the Treasury decides not to elect a fault, a technical default. Hopefully they do elect, you know, as we're trying to go navigate these waters here. It was a 20% decline, 20 plus percent decline in the S&P in 2011, coupled with a debt downgrade. Hopefully the Treasury doesn't play chicken and they actually decide to prioritize spending to meet our debt obligations as opposed to choosing to elect a technical default. Um, but uh, but anyway, so we'll see. I mean, so this this does create uncertainty for the market, and certainly that's reflected right now in the uh, um, in the in the in the volatility measures, uh, like the VIX, for example, the three month VIX uh, skew, etc. Now, while this is happening, however, it's it's kind of hard. Well, where do we expect to see some sort of movement? And you'll see some bank and financial stocks in here, right? Like Capital and financial and. Wells Fargo, some bigger cap tech names, AMD's up 2% today, Meta in there, Texas Instruments, but again, bank and, and technology really seem to kind of you know, lead the day here. But something I'm kind of watching, and this is uh, you know from last week's option activity, but this was on Friday, you start to see more rotation into Chinese stocks, like for example, a K-Web. And uh, on Friday, it was the uh, uh, a couple of bigger, bigger trades, May, uh, 2850 calls, uh, 2830. So kind of targeting up here around 30. And today we saw it kind of break 5.79% higher. And there is an additional trade. This is a May 28, 2850, 30 uh, for May expiration and also a June 32 up here. So we're looking at Chinese stocks, you know, maybe catching rallies. So we're seeing money flow, potential gamma in these days that may help kind of drive things. Uh, Don had an in out spread on BABA. Uh, off the lows down here, and he closed it out for 30% gain last week. But BABA has earnings coming up here, and even in BABA today, you're seeing a July 80 down here and a 120 up here, and a very widespread, um, you know, 2,500 bought down here, selling 5,000 up there. So again, we're we're kind of we're kind of buying you know, kind of a ratio ratioed kind of spread here, but 120 kind of you know, potentially that target is going to happen on the earnings, not necessarily. But the idea is that, look, I mean, July expiration, could we see some rotation to Chinese stocks? Maybe. I mean, it, it's a possibility if the dollar continues to, to weaken. If we look at UP today, um, you'll see that uh, the dollar was down slightly after a nice little pop on Friday. So again, a technical default may lead to more weakness in the dollar. This may help emerging markets, stocks. You know, again, you look at EEM. The biggest uh, um, allocation is to Chinese companies. EM was up 2% today. So it looks like there's, there's some interest, even in FXI as an example here. Um, we're looking at, uh, uh, you know, kind of a, a, um, 
a combination type spread here, pseudo synthetic, uh, buying the 30, selling the 33. So again, going back to that January high and uh, selling some puts down at 25. So the idea is that, look, it's kind of more premium neutral, but we're just looking for this thing to break above 30 towards 33. And again, we saw this interest start to build on Friday and we're starting to see the effect of that today. And we may, we are, you know, the today's trade in these, in these stocks are looking for maybe a retest going back to January's high in FXI uh, towards January. So at least towards, um, you know, the highs from uh, March in uh, K-Web and then Baba, we're looking at even possibly getting back to 120 up here. So uh, this is certainly an area to, to watch or consider opportunities in. Um, if we look at K-Web right now, if you look at the uh, um, implied volatility, uh, you know, the out of the money calls, we are seeing rising implied volatility. That's for a June expiration. So you could construct like an upside call spread, like buy a 30 and sell a 33. And that might cost you, you know, maybe uh, um, 39 cents or 29 cents maybe. So again, very high, low risk, high reward, um, low probability. But, you know, if we get to 33, that's a pretty nice payout if we're to get there. So the vol skew is beneficial for a lot of these products like K-Web, for example, if you're targeting, uh, you know, kind of going back towards the, uh, the the January highs back there. So I thought that was kind of an interesting dynamic kind of playing out today. Um, while AMD was up, um, you know, it's one of those things where, you know, we kind of hit a resistance back here from uh, March. So this is one of those areas that really kicked things off back on uh, January 9th. And in fact, that's this is one of the stocks, AMD, NVIDIA, were two stocks we talked about as opportunity at that for the long, for the long up for the upside. Um, right now we had a big move last week. There was some some bullish option activity in AMD, and we kind of hit the highs. We backed off and we're back up today. But it, we're kind of in an area that could be a bit stretched. So some of the technology space was so high, was up decently today. As we get back towards 100 on on AMD. You know, is there a downside case to be made? And, and certainly today, as you look at uh, the May expiration in here, we've got four days left. Um, the downside kind of activities really kind of picked up today uh, to some degree. And so, again, we're kind of looking at the ideas that we're starting to put a little pressure as we reach a high. And this is where the in-out spread, if we bounce back up to 100, could be pretty effective where you buy in the money, a higher strike price, sell a lower strike price out of the money, like a $2 wide. This could create a decent dynamic in the next month looking for some sort of pullback. But again, bearish interest today uh, on this kind of 91 strike out of the money down here, for example, 30,000 contracts against 22, but you're seeing a whole bevy of activity kind of building as we as we test the resistance up here. Um, another company is Hasbro, and then we'll look at some uh, short stocks, uh, high short interest stocks. Hasbro you know, kind of broke out here today. There was previously, it looked like things were setting up on the bearish end but on average volume, we broke out. And yet what happened is we see some, some spread activity come in on Hasbro today for August. So it's out there a little ways. But again, this is a reflection on consumer spending. Certainly spending in the first quarter was better than expected. But buying this case at 55, selling a 47.50, you're buying the 37 vol, you're selling the 43 vol. And, and as you look at the downside, you're basically retesting prior lows down here. So as we inch closer and closer towards that 65 area of resistance, you know, again, do we start to build the down case, the downside scenario here as the recession starts to take hold in the coming months, maybe coinciding with the debt ceiling? Certainly this trade was, would tend to take that approach, and it's a relatively cheap spread by virtue of it's out of the money, and um, it is also um, uh, the skew is favorable. Now, you could even do something like an, an outspread here. 95 days is kind of a long time, but looking even out 30 days, if we can ed edge even a little bit closer here towards 65, uh, again, you know, right now you could see a, a, 60, a 65, 57, 50, buying that and selling that. Um, again, as we approach 62, 50 or 65, a 65, 60, 65, 60, 50, um, this will help kind of, again, these are reasonably priced because of the skew. So again, you could see where this move goes. And as we test the resistance, look to put something on. We're expecting even just a small decline in the stock. But this is obviously looking for a much, much bigger decline in the coming months uh, on Hasbro. Um, 
Anyway. All right, let's look at the possibility of a short squeeze here. If the market is going to go higher, and we saw last week, you know, this kind of short squeeze starting to gain some ground. Uh, Fubo last week on that day right here after the on the 5th. Uh, sorry. Yeah, sorry, it was on the Friday before. On the 5th, I mean, we saw bullish option call activity come in. The stock surged to about 214, and we backed off it. And, and today, we're looking at what? Another bounce. So the idea being is that could we see a swing back to 250 or possibly even $3? This stock has, at least as of a couple weeks ago, had about 16% short interest, meaning that 16% of the float was shorted. And again, the idea is we had the earnings, we had a little bit of a positive uh, uh, result, and uh, and then we're starting to squeeze the shorts here, and we we are having option gamma to help kind of create the upside here as well. So no real significant option activity on FUBU necessarily today, but we are seeing another bounce off support, and if we gain a little traction, in particular takeout 13, we could see a further short squeeze. This thing may have a chance of retesting prior highs at about 320. Another one that tends to coincide with a short squeeze as well is, is Upstart Holdings. Uh, this stock had a big breakout in its earnings. It pulled back. We did close below the low of the, a low of the gap day right here. But today we saw a significant candle, almost a Mirabozo candle. We're at the high of the session. We opened at the low of the session, engulfing the three prior candles. Again, just further illustrative of a potential short squeeze here, looking at about maybe 26 to the upside if this does continue. And this uh, particular industry uh, was was the best performing industry today in the market, in part because of these stocks. Even something like uh, Yuxin Limited, it's a Chinese education company. This is one we looked at back here in my, one of my Friday sessions. We finally got that breakout. We're seeing the pullback. This one does not exactly have much much of any short interest, but you know we're seeing it. We're kind of at the halfway point, looking at maybe a retest back at 250. This is kind of the expectation we set here, looking at 61. If we break that, looking to full retest back to 250. And this was based upon uh, some movement back on the 28th that coincided with CORs, for example, earnings back here on the 28th. And that was one of the one of the stocks um, that, that we looked at as, as part of that rotation towards education-type companies, this internet, internet software and service industry uh, or, or industry group. Another one that's kind of interesting that does have significant short interest is Real. Uh, this is a this is a reseller of uh, of uh, you know um, designer type merchandise. Uh, this had a nice big move back here on volume on the earnings. We pulled back, volume declined. We're seeing another big day today. You could look at the high there at about a buck forty as a trigger, uh, but this is one that again has significant short interest at seventeen percent. If we start to break way, short start to cover. And this would be maybe an expected target about 240. And again, there's ways to play this. You know, you, you can look at the options market and and look at like an upside call spread. You'll see 11,309 of volume today on that 16 June expiration at the, at the 150 call strike. And you look at today's option activity, 69% um, at the ask. So again, we're seeing significant long call activity today for that 16 June expiration. And again, this could help create that gamma as we break above 150 and help drive the stock. So we get the double kind of positive feedback loop of option gamma plus a short squeeze in the real real. Uh, another stock, we'll have two more we're going to talk about. We'll wrap it up. But uh, ERO, um, ERO Copper, this is a South American op copper company. It's one we saw that I talked about last September. And we said it laid out this kind of projected move, trend target, and then kind of pie in the sky at 423. We came very close to that. We saw a big breakdown and a move today. But today we did see some movement in materials and specifically in copper companies. So again, if this finds support from a reward perspective, we're looking at about 21, where it supports about 1725. So a very and decent reward to risk if we see continued movement in copper. And another one of these is uh, Ivanhoe Electric. This one actually another copper producer uh, broke out on Friday, continued to move today. Looking at $16 up here, they actually have some uh, uh, property here in Utah to the Tintic region. A lot of hot water, <laughs> maybe keeping them off, off that stuff. But uh, but again, nice breakout today, volume 
looking at a test of about 16 and a quarter up there uh, for these couple of co copper companies. Well, folks, I hope this has been helpful. Uh, kind of just you know, giving kind of a sense of the landscape that's happening in the market, the backdrop of the debt ceiling. And we'll catch you back, back next week on the video. Have a good one. Thank you.